Okay, um, hello. Today we are going to be talking about uh, continuous functions on R. Continuous functions on R. And um, I believe I planned for this to be a t sort of a two part. Um, so this is, oh, well. This is part one. Um, so, um, in the last two lectures, we talked about the topology on R, right? And that essentially allowed us to apply uh, the results from the topology lectures to the real numbers. Um, in particular, in the last lecture on metric series, or sorry, not metric series, uh, metric spaces, um, we showed that the topological definition of continuity, uh, so topological definition, is that um, if you have a function from x to y, where x and y are topological spaces, then for any open set v and u, or uh, v and y, I, I am uh, not talking correctly today, uh, for any open set v contained in, um, I guess this can be, a, uh, include y as well, then um, the inverse image of this open set is open in the topology of X. Um, <clears throat> and so, right, again, we talked about how if X and Y are metric spaces, um, then you can actually relate this topological definition to a metric definition, which is that... Um, let me say here that um, let's see. So we want to say if f is continuous at a point x, then uh, right. Essentially, uh, the open sets. You can think of the open sets as being balls of some radius, so um, f inverse of b's bar of y is open. So um, so if x is in this set, and let me, instead of r, I'm going to write delta, because this is the typical uh, notation. Um, if x is in this set, well, for one, we know by definition that means f of x is in the ball of uh, radius delta at y. Um, I'll just put that as like a side bubble. Then, right, <clears throat> if I have some point in the open set in a metric space, that means I can find some ball of radius, uh, a, a ball of sufficient radius, which is contained in this set. So then there is, and I'm going to call that radius epsilon, such that b sub epsilon of x is contained in the inverse image of b sub delta of y. Thus, for any z in this ball, f of z is in um, is in this ball, right? So we can think of 
right? So here we've just we've rewritten the topological defer definition in terms of the metric, um, although we're sort of using the um, the topological notation of the metric space. Uh, we can rewrite this again, right? Because remember, what is what does it mean for a point to be in some ball? This means exactly that the distance between P and Q is less than the radius. So I will again put this aside. Um, so in terms of the metrics, Uh, we have that if the distance, and this is the metric with respect to x, right? Because x and y are going to have different metric functions uh, in general. The distance in x, and this is big X, uh, uh, not to be confused with this point x. Um, the distance between x and z is less than epsilon. So if this is true, then the distance in y between um, y and z is less than delta, right? And um, so this is continuity at x, right? Well. Um, if, if you wanted to be uh, uh, actually if you wanted to say the typical formulation um, right so we, we sort of keep rewriting this in, in different terms but so the typical the typical thing is that um, F is continuous at some point x and x if for all delta greater than zero um, there is an epsilon greater than zero such that if um, oh and here Sorry, I should have written f of z here, um, such that if the x distance between x and z is less than epsilon, then the y distance between f of x and f of z is less than delta, right? So here, uh, we've just taken this this most recent formulation, right? We keep reformulating it. We've taken this most recent formulation and we've replaced this variable y with f of x, right? So we've just, we can just think of this as f of x. Why? Um, because, because f of x is always going to be in a ball of radius delta around f of x. <laughs> um, sort of by definition, right? As long as this delta is greater than zero, right? Which we are assuming here. Um, as long as this delta is greater than zero, uh, the distance between f of x and f of x is going to be zero, which is going to be less than delta, right? And so we can take this as a definition um, <clears throat> uh, for continuity on R, right? So since R is a metric space with the distance function, right, is the absolute value of the difference. <clears throat> um, uh, we can use this definition um, so we would say 
if x minus z absolute value is less than epsilon, this implies that the absolute value of f of x minus f of z is less than delta, right? Uh, and so this is for <clears throat> functions from r to r, right? We're implicitly assuming that this is a function from r to r. Of course, <coughs> sorry, we can, um, of course, we can use this definition in general for functions between any metric spaces, right? So we could have a function from a metric space to R. Um, we could have a function from R to a metric space. Um, and that's sort of the beauty of this. In general, right, we could have a function from R to a topological space or from a topological space to R, uh, just using this general definition of um, open sets, right? Um, but this is the the epsilon delta formulation that people learn in calculus, right? So that's that's really the whole point of that first slide. Um, <clears throat> the next thing I want to show is that um, continuity preserves limits, right? So, so let a sub n be a sequence in R with the a sub n converge to some limit L, right? And we're also going to assume this is an R. Uh, I write this because we're assuming it's not converging to infinity. Well, it doesn't converge to infinity, but we've used the notation with the arrow. So I just want to be explicit. This is an infinity. Um, then f of a sub n as a sequence converges to f of l. Uh, so, oh, so, uh, and let f from r to r be continuous, then as a sequence, f of a sub n converges to f of l. Right? So let's prove this. Um, the first step, right, is that we want to uh, somehow relate continuity um, to the convergence of sequences. Uh, and we've already seen how we can um, sort of the the hint here is in the notation, right? In continuity, we've used the variable epsilon, and in um, <clears throat> in convergence, we've also used epsilon, right? So essentially, if we want to prove that this sequence converges to this limit, right? Um, we want to set some target distance, right? We want to show that for n big enough, f of a sub n is going to be big enough or uh, close enough to f of l. So, so let uh, we're going to say uh, let epsilon be greater than zero, right? Um, let u be the open set f inverse of um, f of l minus epsilon to f of l plus epsilon, right? So this here is an open interval, open interval. And so since f is continuous, we know that u is open. Um, we then have L is in U, right? Uh, why is L in U? Because f of L is going to be contained in this in, uh, open interval, right? That's the definition of an inverse image, right? Um, L is in the inverse image, means that f of L is in the, uh, the set here. <clears throat> uh, 
that since u is open, let delta greater than zero be such that uh, the interval l to d or l minus d uh, to l plus sorry I'm saying d I am out of it today is contained in u right uh, this delta must exist by definition of open sets in metric spaces right we have to have some ball of radius delta um, which fits inside the open set um, now we know from a sub n converging to L that if uh, that there is some natural number such that when our index is bigger than or equal to this natural number, um, <clears throat> the a sub n values are going to be falling in this interval, right? Uh, because again, this is a an equivalent definition. This is equivalent to saying that the distance between L and a sub n is less than delta, right? This is equivalent. Um, then, uh, then a sub n, right? We said that this is a subset of u. So then these are, these a sub n are in u for n greater than or equal to n. And then since u is an inverse image, we can apply the function and we have f of a sub n is in this interval, f of l minus epsilon to f of l plus epsilon. For n greater than or equal to n. Thus, the distance between f of l and f of a sub n is less than epsilon for all n greater than or equal to n. So f of a sub n converges to f of l. Right? And that's just definition. <clears throat> Um, the next thing, I want to make a little note on terminology, um, uh, for, for just future stuff. When I say an interval, this can mean one of four things. The open interval A to B, or one of the half open, half closed intervals, or the closed interval, right? And I never explicitly defined these sets, so I guess I'll do that here. Um, these are all just defined as sets where um, these are real numbers such that the x values in this set are satisfying inequalities, right? Um, similarly, a to b is where uh, the closed intervals are where you allow, um, you allow the endpoints, right? You allow x to be equal to a or b. Right? So here, you, x could be equal to b, but not a, and here, x could be equal to a, but not b. Um, so hopefully that's clear. Um, I should have defined that earlier, uh, but I assumed most people would be familiar with that. Uh, I know some, uh, some people denote, instead of a parentheses, they use sort of a backwards um, 
uh, a backwards thing. So this would be the same thing as what I would denote as parentheses a, b, uh, close bracket. Um, some people use a backwards bracket, um, but I didn't grow up with that notation, um, so I don't use it. Um, so another thing is that if i is an interval, right, so it could be any of these four things, and c and d are in, are, uh, are in i with c less than or equal to d, then the entire closed interval from c to d is a subset of i. Um, and this is something you can just check for each of the four cases, right? I'm not going to prove that here because it's just really tedious and just it's just inequalities, uh, really. Uh, and this sh this should be relatively intuitive, right? If you just think about the intervals um, geometrically. Um, the last thing I'm going to prove here, um, because I sort of took up more time than I thought I would, uh, so I'm going to cut the video short. Um, we're going to prove that uh, let f be a continuous function from i to r, right? So, um, uh, so b continuous, right? And this is saying it's a it's a it's like a function from r to r, right? But instead, we're only allowing um, and so i is an interval here, um, but we're only allowing inputs from this interval, right? Um, the, continu the continuity still works the same. Uh, you can think of that in terms of subspace topology, um, right? Then, uh, let's see. Then for all A, B, and I with um, A less than B and uh, and K strictly between f of a and f of b, then there is some element c in the open interval from a to b, uh, such that f of c equals k. And so, um, I guess I took up more space than I wanted to just writing this. Um, how should I do this? I'm actually going to I'm going to take this to the next page um, to prove it. But you've probably seen this before um, as the intermediate value theorem, right? You've probably seen this in calculus, and now we're going to prove it. Um, so proof, and let me write theorem here. I, theorem. So this is the intermediate value theorem. Uh, all right. So so this line here, where k is, we say k is strictly between f of a and f of b. Um, what this means is that we know that a is less than b, but we don't implicitly know that um, uh, that f of a um, is less than f of b, right? For all we know, f of a could be greater than f of b, or even f of a could be equal to f of b, in which case we sort of have a vacuous 
uh, assumption because k couldn't exist in that case. But uh, all I mean to say here is that um, we don't necessarily know the ordering between f of a and f of b, but the proofs are similar, so we're going to assume that f of a is less than k is less than f of b, right? Um, and for good measure, you should also do it the other way around, where f of b is less than k is less than f of a, but the proofs are pretty much similar, so uh, or pretty much the same, uh, not even just similar, but pretty much the same. You just have to flip some inequalities here and there. Um, and so, as you should hopefully be used to by now, we are going to use interval halving. Um, and like I've said, interval halving is one of the um, main tools of elementary real analysis, uh, which is kind of beautiful. Um, so we're going to let a1 equal a, a2 equal b, or not, um, not a2, b1 equal b. Uh, and so let m be the average between these two. Uh, if f of m is greater than k, then let, let a to equal a, uh, and b2 is going to be equal to m, right? In which case, we still have that k is going to be between f of a and f of, or k will still be between f of a2 and f of b2, right? Here, k is between f of a1 and f of b2, or b1, sorry. I can't speak today. Um, uh, so that f of a2 is less than k is less than f of b2. Um, otherwise, let uh, um, now, if f of m is equal to k, then m is equal to our c value, right? And we're done, um, right? m is the required value such that f of m equals k. Um, if f of m is less than k, then let, um, we're going to let a2 equal m and b2 equal b. Um, and so we repeat this process. Oh, and technically I should write, for to be clear, I should write a2 equals a1 and b2 equals b1. Um, right, so now repeat repeat, we are going to have some value, uh, right, if this process goes infinitely, right, we've seen we have the possibility of ending up with one of these midpoints equaling k, right, um, but assume it just goes on infinitely, then we have seen that uh, the intersection of uh, of the closed intervals a and b n is going to be equal to some single point set, right? Uh, now c, since i was an interval, right? i is an interval, and a, b, or an i with a less than b, right? That means that each of these closed intervals is inside of i, right? Therefore, um, c is in i, because c is in all these closed intervals, which are all in i. Um, 
So f is continuous at c. Now, also in in the uh, proof that the intersection of these closed intervals equals a point set, we showed that a sub n converges to c, and b sub n also converges to c. So since f preserves limits, since continuous functions preserve limits, we have f of a sub n converges to f of c, and f of b sub n converges to f of c. Um, but But we knew that for each n, right, we had k was being sandwiched between f of a sub n and f of b. So in the limit, right, um, essentially, uh, so uh, so k is in the intersection of the f of a spin and the f of b spins, uh, which of course this is going to be equal to f of c, right? Um, because both of these, both of these converge to f of c. Uh, Thus, f of c equals k as desired. So that is the proof of the intermediate value theorem. Um, now, I didn't get to cover as much as I wanted to, so uh, <laughs> the continuous functions might be a three-part series, um, but uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next one.